Welcome to Giant City State Park. What a great afternoon to actually be inside looking at beautiful pictures of plants. Um, I would like to introduce our speaker for the day, the fabulous Christopher David Benda, uh, AKA the botanizer. So let's give him a, a warm hand. Well, thanks for coming out to the presentation. I'm trying to enter the 21st century here with uh, getting some of the Zoom link a live presentation option, and I'm gonna record this as well, and I'll put it on my YouTube channel later. So if you wanna watch it again or share it with someone else, it'll be available there. So I was um, giving four programs a year for Giant City pre-pandemic, and this is my first in-person presentation here since, uh, of course, that event that has changed all of our lives. So I'm happy to be back. So we, we, we skipped the 2020, uh, best of nature, but we're, we're back on a roll now. So that's great. And I also want to mention that um, actually 2019 is the last year that I did this presentation. And that was my best year botanically, professionally until this year, I would say. So 2020 was a little bit of a light year anyway. And this year has been amazing. And so I have a lot of ex excellent things that I want to share with you all. So as you probably know, my name is Chris Benda, and I have a lot of former and current affiliations with various uh, organizations and agencies throughout Illinois. But starting in January, I was hired to be the coordinator for the Plants of Concern program, which is a volunteer-based rare plant monitoring program out of the Chicago Botanic Garden. And they've been doing this in Northeast Illinois and a little bit in Indiana um, since uh, for, for the last 20 years. So this has been kind of a long time in the making to extend the program to Southern Illinois. And that was finally um, able to be done. And I was hired in January. So I'm almost a full year in on that position full-time with Southern Illinois University. And my esteemed uh, colleague and assistant, Travis Neal was here in the audience. And he worked with me this summer and the two of I just rocked and rolled every day. And it was amazing. So I'm happy to show, share with you some of those experiences that we had. Uh, I, you could also find me online or on Facebook, uh, Instagram, et cetera, as Illinois Botanizer, and my <laughs> website, of course, IllinoisBotanizer.com. So check that out. Um, I also have some merchandise here that you're able to, free to look over after the presentation and talk to me about that. So I'll first mention that this is um, the current reach of the program, the Plants of Concern. So as you see, Northeast Illinois and a couple counties there in, in uh, Indiana have been, uh, had this program for 20 years, actually, they celebrated the 20 year anniversary this year. Um, but this was the first year where it was extended to Southern Illinois. We decided to um, <clears throat> use, call Southern Illinois as the unglaciated, any counties that had unglaciated terrain would be included. And that's why it kind of skirts up the Mississippi River there to St. Clair, Monroe, um, Randolph counties, and then the southernmost 11. So that's what we're calling Southern Illinois uh, for this program. And there's really a lot to share with you. So I'm just going to get right into it and start with the filming fern. So sometimes they call this the Appalachian filmy fern, Vandenboskia boskianum, and it grows back in the recesses of sandstone overhangs where it's dark, where it's hard to reach. So, you know, when botanists are looking for this plant, you're really kind of doing this kind of thing, you know, just to see them, sometimes even with a flashlight. Um, so what was exciting about this particular occurrence was that um, the last a biologist to look for this species here reported failed to find in the database. So we went there in February. This is another neat thing. Like in Southern Illinois, a lot of plants stay pretty green in the winter time. So even though I was hired in January, I like in February, I was out on the ground, you know, visiting places because the filming fern is still very evident uh, in the winter time. And as you can see in the picture, we found where it was supposed to be located. So that was really exciting that we were able to uh, sort of you know, reverse the fail to find uh, occurrence for this species. This was in uh, Polk County here near Eddyville. And then what was really cool about last year, and I'm sure most of you experienced this or are aware, is that we had this snowstorm and this cold weather that lasted for like a week or 10 days. 
And it was amazing. We went out to find frozen waterfalls. And this is at Jackson Hole Ecological Area. This is kind of one of the upper cascades. So Jackson Hole is a big canyon. It's, it's just really only one good way to get down into that area. Um, I want to clarify that we have Jackson Falls, where people rock climb. We have Jackson Hollow, which is on Trig Tower Road. And the Jackson Hole is off of Mustang Lane, even farther east there, closer to, to Eddyville. So um, there's one way to get down in there, and this is the main waterfall that was frozen. Now, I've seen this one frozen top to bottom in previous years. So that was neat to see. It was a little bit thicker of a column. Um, we went over to Borks Falls, which is, of course, part of Burn Cliff State Park. Um, and that was really interesting. You can see the column on the right has already sort of broken off a little bit. When we pulled up on the scene, we saw ice climbers climbing up that right side column where it looked like it had broken away. And I thought, that seems nuts. But uh, <laughs> they, they were successful. And, of course, this is such a beautiful spot um, any time of the year. But what was really exciting about the frozen waterfalls, what I have been wanting to see for 10 years or more was Pack and Tuck at Camp Andesong. Oh. So they have a picture in their visitor center, in their, in their lodge, that shows this scene of a, a frozen column of ice and the waterfall. This is the tallest waterfall in Illinois. So it's about 93 feet or so. So it's really rare that it frozes into a column. And when I've inquired about this photo that's in their lodge, they said, I'm not sure what year that was. I've never seen it like that. I've been working with Camp Andesong for over 10 years, and it's never been like this. So that was really neat to finally see it frozen into a column. It may never not do this again in my lifetime, it, or it may happen, you know, who knows when. Also, you know, we had about maybe six, eight inches of fresh snow. It lasted for a while because it stayed cold. And on the top of Pack and Tuck, where we uh, accessed this waterfall, no tracks at all. Like one spot had like some deer tracks, but no people had been there yet. So we really felt like, you know, kind of wilderness solitude in Southern Illinois by visiting this amazing site. Another thing that was cool was um, Shannon Sharp is the botanist of the Shawnee National Forest, and she was updating Esplenium resilience. And I had never seen this fern before. And so we went to look for it at one of the sites where it's well known. And from the information that she was giving us, it sounded like this thing was near extinction. Very little was known about it in, in the last 20 years. And what had been shared was that, oh, a few individuals were seen. Um, at one site, it had been over collected in like the 50s and 60s. So they knew that it was uh, imperiled for that reason. So we went to the site and found, you know, hundreds of them and were kind of inspired and uh, went to all the sites that this was ever recorded. And there are five and they're in Alexander, Union and Jackson counties. And we went to all of them, but one, there was a reporting near Gale that we could not, it was no specific um, point or anything. So we couldn't relocate that, but the other four were all found, you know, extant, which means you know, present uh, uh, in these in, in these three counties. So that was really exciting. Right away, I felt like to be able to confirm this existence of this fern in all three counties that was previously known, and something I had not seen before. Except one of the sites we went to, I had evaluated during my job as the natural areas ecologist with the Illinois Natural Areas Inventory Update in 2018 to 2012. And I was there in 2009, and I thought. I went through here. How did I not see this fern? So I went back into my photos and lo and behold, I find this photo of a fern that I never identified. And that's what it was. So I had seen it before. I just had forgotten. So this is distinct, though. It looks sort of like our ebony spleenwort fern, which is super common in all the woods. But um, it's got a little different shape to it. It's got a blue gray color that's different. And they'll grow side by side, but you know, when you look at plants all day, every day, they start to really separate themselves. And so I think this is distinct. So that was really exciting uh, in February to kind of you know, get rolling on, on the rare plant monitoring. Now, another plant, I had seen this um, vegetatively in Illinois, but I'd never seen the flowers. And I was under the assumption that this was a rare plant. It's Illinois endangered, the early saxifrage, formerly Saxifraga, now in the genus Micranthes. And it only grows in Hardin County. 
And not only is it only Hardin County, it's only Hardin County along the Ohio River in a few of these canyons and ravine systems. So I'm thinking, wow, this is this is a rare plant I've, I've never seen. I want to see it in flower. So we go over there in March and we see it right away at one of the sites. And we start measuring the extent of the population and trying to count individuals. And we go on further and further. It was everywhere, literally all the exposed sandstone. I thought, there's no way we can count this. We can't measure this. You know, we can document where it is, but hundreds and thousands. I went to... Uh, the area of Sturgeon Hill Battery Rock, which is where the River to River Trail formerly was, you know, the trailhead. I counted our estimated 28,000 plants. I mean, it was all over the place. So uh, Travis and I were, came up with this hashtag not rare uh, saying that we were, we, we were uh, using because it seemed like it was some of these plants that I've never seen before that are endangered are actually not super rare. So this is kind of an example of what I saw. Anywhere there was exposed sandstone, there was loads of flowering saxifrage there. Absolutely amazing. So that was really cool to see. Now, another plant that's not very common in our area or in Illinois, frankly, is leatherwood, Durka palustris. And so this is a species that may actually be, get on the endangered species list uh, as threatened at some point. But when it blooms in early April, late March, it's very conspicuous. And the name leatherwood comes from the fact that the twigs are really bendy. You, I joke and say you could tie your shoes with a twig of leatherwood. In fact, um, what was exciting is that this site, uh, the, the state forester um, was working with the landowner on his management plan. And he said, I got this shrub that you can just bend and it doesn't break. And what is it? And here that became the Johnson County record for this particular shrub um, in Illinois. And he had hundreds in his woods all blooming. I've never seen anything like that in Illinois. Really, really amazing. And they're cute little um, yellow flowers. Now, there's other things about this species that make it conspicuous other times of year to identify. But when it's in flower, it's just so obvious. And so we ended up going to all of the Durka spots um, in southern Illinois and finding it extant. And of course, while I'm out, I find things maybe not so rare, but very beautiful. And you're always searching for the perfect photo and bloodroot is so neat that the flowers are in full bloom before the leaves have really fully unfurled and you see it kind of hugging around the stem. So I thought that was a, a beautiful example of bloodroot. And then Bellsmith Springs has a number of kind of funny looking trees there. I've noticed a, you know, these around throughout Illinois, you see little limbs, usually they're the, on oak trees. So we joke and say, this must be a male uh, <laughs> specimen here, even though oaks are monoecious, they have male and female flowers in the same tree. Another interesting plant that's quite rare in Illinois is the Hartley plantain. And what's kind of fun about this one, like a number of rare plants in Illinois, is they have really common and even sometimes what we would call weedy counterparts, right? The common plantain is a lawn weed um, and it grows in sidewalk cracks and, you know, all the kinds of stuff. But this is a rare one that has chordate or heart-shaped leaf base called the heart leaf plantain. And it grows in the stream, in clear, rocky, <clears throat> undisturbed streams. Where are those, right? I mean, a lot of our streams have been impacted by <coughs> extreme flooding, erosion. Um, you know, if there's a, you know, horseback riding, sometimes they love to go through creeks. So there's a lot of threats to this particular species. But I think there were eight or nine locations I went to and found it at most of them. Uh, and only at like three sites where there more than, a, where there are a few hundred or more. Most of them are pretty, pretty few. So another plant, now this is interesting too, that pennywort, Obularia virginica, <clears throat> the Greek coin was an oval. That's why the name Obularia relates to pennywort. It's got these round leaves. This is in the gentian family. And it's a small little plant that's kind of hard to see. And um, there are a number of things in Illinois that I feel like I felt were rare when I was not doing intensive botanical inventories, when I was just out and about noticing plants that I would see hiking and whatever. And I felt like God, pennywort seems to be rare. But if you go and really intensely survey a lot of places and you're looking and recording everything, you start to realize things that you thought were rare are actually not all that rare. And this totally fits that category. Um, this one is, is pretty widespread in the forest. It's just, it's hard to find, hard to see, 
Um, but it's really not as rare as, it's, as it seems. And like I said, there's a number of species that fit that category for me in Illinois, which makes you know, botanizing really fun, frankly. But this one I would say is truly rare. And this is not listed in Illinois as endangered or threatened, but I think it should be the red buckeye. Now, this is easy to obtain. A lot of people have this in their yard. I've planted some in my yard, you know, which makes sense. They're really beautiful. Um, the state champion is outside of its range in someone else's yard, you know, in Illinois. But there's only, I think, four or five locations that I know of where this occurs naturally. And the best spot is Horseshoe Lake, Horseshoe Lake Nature Preserve. Now, it's a long walk to get back there because you can't. We arranged to be able to drive with the site superintendent, but normally you walk back to the island preserve and it's hard to get back there. But the dominant understory shrub throughout that whole area is red buckeye. And when you go, when they're in bloom, it was one of the most magical things I've ever seen. I was like, this is a botanical wonderland. This is a treasure, botanical treasure in Southern Illinois. The, the, that quantity of red buckeye, it's so conspicuous and beautiful in bloom. I mean, I put this as like the top five, you know, botanical uh, wildflower events to see in our area. Now, this is another species that fit that same uh, criteria I said earlier, where I was like, I've never seen this plant. Where does it grow? I don't understand. How is it not endangered? Um, if you look at the <laughs> Flora of Southern Illinois by Dr. Molenbrock, 1959 publication, he's got a picture of it, and he says, Hooven Hollow. So my friend Abel Kinzer and I, this was uh, actually um, during the pandemic, we had a little free time, and we went to Hooven Hollow to track down Iris Cristata and found it blooming there. And actually what was interesting is we found it blooming there on April 15th. And in his book, the picture says, here's dwarf crested iris in full bloom on May 15th. We were a full month early and it was blooming. And we saw it there along the creek in several places. And that's the, that last year was the first time I've ever seen it. So this year out in Pope and Hardin counties, you can find it in the right ravines where it's not all that uncommon. It's just very restricted. And again, the state forester <clears throat> contacted um, Nick and I, and she said, I saw a big patch of this along the roadside on uh, Dutch and Chapel Road, which is in Pope County. And we went out there and I'd never seen anything like it. Hundreds in this little terrace along the road, in between the road and the creek, all blooming. Absolutely amazing. It's just a little <laughs> short little plant, really beautiful iris. And a lot of people have planted that in their yard. You know, it's easy to, to obtain. Um, so here's another plant, too, that fits the same category. I was like, Cecily Bellward, John Schwegman showed me this on the Heron Pond Trail, like, I don't know, maybe five years ago, because I was like, where does this plant grow? I never see it. Well, since then, I've seen it, you know, in the coastal plain and the east branch of the Cedar Creek near Camp Andesong has got a lot of it. So it's around, but it's definitely not common. I feel like this should be, this is really the false Solomon seal. You know, Solomon seal uh, and false Solomon seal, they don't look all that similar. But look at these flowers. They look just like Solomon seal flowers. But this is bellwort. It's not even in the same genus. So I find that really interesting. And um, one way to tell them apart is that when bellwort flowers, it'll branch. They'll have two separate stems. And Solomon seal will never do that. So that's a, a clear, and if you, the fruits are totally different, that's why, of course, they're not in the same genus. These have little triangular fruits. Solomon seal got a little round, like blue fruits. So different, but uh, very beautiful plants. Now, I had this funding this year to remeasure champion trees in Illinois. So the Il Illinois Big Tree Registry has keeps track of the largest mm -hmm. specimen of every native tree species in Illinois. And they have to be remeasured every 10 years to stay viable. And so there's one person running this program in Champaign. He cannot you know, do all this alone. So I had this funding to update the program. And I went to 38 or 40 trees to measure that hadn't been measured in a while, including this wonderful state champion flowering dogwood. I'm sure most of you are familiar with dogwoods. You know, you, a big one seems like something like that. And so I thought, how big is this? It, it, it's, it's really impressive. And it was planted there in the late 1800s. They know everything about this tree. Um, in fact, I had a little uh, um, fan club there watching me measure this tree because they all assembled and wanted to see it. And, and I wanted to time it with the full glorious bloom. 
And they said I was a little bit late, but it still looks pretty amazing. I've never seen uh, flowering dogwood like that. So that was really cool. Now, wild leeks in Southern Illinois are not very common either. And they're not listed in the state. They, they occur statewide. So they're, they're common enough across the state. But in Southern Illinois, again, I think I have five places where I know where they grow, not very many. And this is actually a private um, site near, um, there's a stone quarry near Kincaid in uh, Jackson County. And I got all the owner. He said, yeah, I can go back there. It was carpet. I mean, it was wildly carpet. I've never seen anything like that. You know, if you've been to Little Grand Canyon, you know, a little bit grows there in a kind of a dense spot. Uh, Fountain Bluff, there's some, um, another private spot that I know of, but this was literally everywhere. And I thought, wow, this is so amazing. And in there was alternate leaf dogwood, uh, the leather wood I mentioned earlier, um, and a bunch of other rarities. And I thought this should be a nature preserve. It was really, really special. Then these stunning beauties, wild azalea, rhododendron pernophyllum. I went to almost every single spot that I could find that had this, and they were all present. In fact, LaRue Pine Hills is kind of one of the great places to go see this, and we found a number of new locations there, including this spot that was just in full glorious bloom. And these are very fragrant flowers. It's like cotton candy. They're really sweet and just pleasantly pleasant smell, and then just totally gorgeous. So again, not listed. It's only known in Alexander uh, Union in Jackson counties, which we confirmed was extant in all those three. So that was good to update uh, the, those county records, so to speak. But just a beautiful, beautiful wildflower. And this is like late April, early May. Good time to see this plant. And then the yellow lady slipper orchid. Again, this is widespread or certainly formally very widespread across Illinois and Eastern North America. But because of, you know, deer browse, habitat destruction, poaching and other things, it's been really uh, affecting the population sizes. So I was trying to get an idea of how rare are these exactly. So again, I went to every site that I had found or had heard about or knew about. I think there were about a dozen or so. And we found them at every single one. This, you know, a lot of orchids are picky and that they don't always bloom every year. They don't come back in the same place, but they're perennial plants. And this one, this is the one that seems to reliably show up every year. It may not flower every year, but it, it usually will grow and, and be conspicuous. Now, I've never sort of, I think one of the sort of holy grails of botanical exploration is encountering an unknown population of yellow lady slippers in bloom that you didn't even know was there. I mean, that's the kind of like drop to your knees kind of moment. And I have not experienced that, unfortunately. I've found some that I didn't know about later in the year, and then I've gone back when they're blooming, and it's still pretty cool, but I haven't had that. Wow, this is totally unexpected. Look at these gorgeous flowers. Um, but that has happened, and that has happened here at Giant City. Uh, but while I was out at this site with volunteers, um, we hiked eight miles this day, going to all these separate uh, yellow lady slipper spots and going to the last one near a waterfall, we walked by a timber rattlesnake. And it was big and stretched out across the rock. And the funny thing is there were three of us, me and two volunteers and myself and a volunteer walked right past it. We're looking at where we're walking because it's wet in the creek. It's slick rock. And the, the last person said, take four steps forward and then turn around. You know, we're like, whoa, what? And there's this just stretched out timber rattlesnake. And then you told me, you know, I, I really like snakes. I realize a lot, some people don't, but I do. Um, I, I you know, respect them. I, I don't, don't handle them. I just like to photograph them and look at them. But coming back through that same area after we'd gone to the waterfall and returned and the snake wasn't there, you're kind of a little bit like, oh, where'd it go? You know, but they are so cryptic. They, you know, they're hard to, hard to see. Now, this is another plant that was formerly listed in Illinois, um, but was taken off because it was found to be too common. It's the American feather foil, Petonia inflata. And this, crazily enough, is in the primrose family. And so... French shooting star or common shooting star, it's related to that. That's when I say people smarter than me are making these determinations. I don't see any resemblance, but uh, it is in that family and it is an annual. So it grows in the water and it has these inflated stems that help it float. 
And when they're blooming, they're quite um, special. In fact, I've come to realize that a lot of people in a lot of other states also feel that the American feather foil is special and rare and they're excited when they see it. So my friend uh, drives around a lot. He's, he works at this business where he's servicing, you know, uh, private homes. And so he's traveling all the time on the road and he's got his, you know, they say good botanist is one eye in the road, one eye in the ditch. So he's got one eye in the ditch and he's driving down on Highway 148, just south of the, where it crosses Crab Orchard. They're, the power line runs along the highway. So they have it, you know, deforested way back from the road and it's all wet in there. And we went in, Travis and I were there. April, maybe perhaps May, hundreds and hundreds of plants, all in full glorious bloom. I've never seen anything like it. It was absolutely amazing. And here's just a little sliver of the, of the scene that we saw there in the roadside ditch. Now this plant, again, you're like, that's beautiful. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Black edge sedge, Carex nigromarginata. So sedges are grass-like plants, they're graminoids, and they're totally different families. So they're somewhat related, but not really. Um, but they have these little fruit called perigenia that are the key to identification. And of course, the perigenia are, they, they ripen and they fall off and they're dispersed. And so if you don't have fruit available, they're very hard to identify. But this species in Missouri was once thought to be rare. And as they were doing more work, they found out actually it's pretty common. But, and I worked in Missouri briefly before moving to Southern Illinois. And so I have the search ID, the search image for this particular species uh, when it's, you know, vegetative. The perigenia, the fruit, they bloom in like April and they fall off like weeks later. So by May, you've lost all identification tools. So that's one reason why I think it's overlooked. It's like three weeks to a month of the year when you can actually identify this for sure. I found nine, I think, or 10 new locations for this species this year. There were only three that I knew of previously. It's dark green. It's got kind of wider leaves. Um, the key, though, is that the perigenia are shorter than the leaves. I kind of joke when you're looking at sedges, most of the most of the fruits are much longer than the leaves. So you kind of like clump them up and you, I, I joke that you're like a barber, you're cutting hair and you kind of pull it up and they'll have a snip like that. So you pull up the thing so you can see the fruit sticking up above the leaves. But these are buried in the leaves. So that's a huge clue. There's not a lot of things that'll be like that. And they're hairy too. So I'm going to go back to all 10 of these spots in April this year and make sure and get a collection and document it. But I'm pretty sure that it, there's 10 new spots for this. So that's been really exciting uh, work from this year. So another really pretty one here is the copper iris. Again, at one time I thought Kind of rare, didn't know a lot of places for it, but it's 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 around in the right habitat when you're down the coastal plain. This is along um, the Loop Road at uh, Mermet Lake, and in fact, they have some there. They have blue ones and copper ones, and then they have like an inner gray that's like a sort of a maroon, really dark color. But it's really beautiful to see these. You know, this is a Southern Illinois thing, like here, Southern Illinois and South. So uh, it's really really fun to go see in May. And then the Guyandot beauty, or they call it the hairy Sinandra, Sinandra hispidula, which grows here, Giant City State Park, one of the eight or nine locations for it. So again, my whole strategy with the plants of concern was, I wanna pick certain species and I wanna go to every single spot that it's known from. So I can say in 2021, this is where it was extant and this is how many were there. So it's very challenging when there's a lot of locations and they bloom you know, at the same time to get out to all these spots. But Sanandra is one of these. And what's really exciting is, so it's only known from Jackson and Williamson County, but has not been seen in Williamson County for a long, long time. So it's essentially only in Jackson County in Illinois. And we went to all the Jackson County sites and I have uh, two volunteers that like to do long distance trail running. And they'll go out and do, you know, 15 miles or something in a day uh, or more probably. Anyway, I would say, hey, keep an eye out for this. Or when you go into this area, let me know if you see that. So they're cruising around in Northern Union County and they sent me a picture. Hey, I think we found Sinandra. And I'm like, Sinandra in Union County? No, there's no known Sinandra in Union County. So I go out there. This is ID in our land. I go out to look and it's like the hardest, farthest to reach spot from the nearest parking lot. And this is what I see. I counted 800 blooming plants, county record, unknown population of this plant, which is so rare in Illinois. 
Um, so that was just like, you know, batter up, she gets it out of the park kind of thing. Which is, there were so many of those this year, just really stunning. Plus, just look at this photo. Oh, they're so gorgeous. And there's a little kind of up close photo. This is in the mint family. So it's mint. Yeah. Now, another cool, I know I say this on every slide, but really, this has been a tremendous, tremendous year. Uh, green trillium, also known here, Giant City State Park not common at all. And in fact, uh, a couple of the places where I know it occurs, there's not a lot of it. So one of them is um, a little east of here and it's private land. In fact, this is kind of a fun story. Jen uh, contacted me a few years ago and she said, I got somebody who came in here and said, she's got green trillium on her property. And I said, mm, no, I'm skeptical. You know, so she's, I think you get a photo. Okay. She gets a photo, sent, text it to me. I'm like, whoa, that's it for sure. So I go out to her property and I count it. And so I knew they were there. So we went out and we, and we counted it on her land and the adjacent landowner. And there were like a hundred or so blooming. So that and here are the only two spots that I knew where it was extant. So then I talked to my friend, uh, Robert Rothrock. And he said, you know, 20 years ago, I was working with this guy and I, I saw it along the creek there. Pretty sure, you know, you should go check it out. So we go out there. It's nearby where this other private land was. <clears throat> we counted 300 blooming plants along this creek that apparently, you know, nobody knew was there previously. So I thought, oh, my gosh, that's amazing. So then I started looking at the map and I'm like, so this, and this was the same creek system. So the one that I knew about was up here. We went downstream to the next one. And I see there's a tributary running into the same system. And I think, I wonder if it's growing along that. And it happened to be public land. Great. I don't have to, you know, get permission. I could just go. So I go with a volunteer into that spot. We count another few hundred. So we doubled the number of known populations for this species um, this is last year. So that's been really exciting. There are records of this in places farther north that I haven't investigated. But as far as southern Illinois, there's four spots now. Um, and, you know, less than a thousand plants. And they're so pretty. Some of them were like two feet tall, too. It was really amazing. Now, I also have um, had a, a, a grant to investigate the distribution and occurrence of American snowbell bush in southern Illinois. And I knew that there were like 22 known spots. So it's threatened, but I thought that seems like kind of a lot of places. Let's, let's figure out how common this actually is. And so, like I said, you got to go to every single spot and you got to count all of them you see. I have counted so many Styrax stems this year. It's unbelievable. Thousands and thousands. And some of those in this room have, have, have can attest to that and have joined me. If you go in, you know, mid to late May and see them bloom, they're really beautiful and conspicuous. Um, and they grow pretty much. Here's Travis here with some of you found in bloom in the Cache River. Uh, quite gorgeous. And then another one here, this is in the Cache River wetlands. Now we found that there are a lot of stems, but a lot of them are sterile. They're young. So it's not super common to find mature uh, adults, um, except at a few select locations where we did find thousands and thousands, but I haven't added it up, but yeah, we're well over 25,000 stems, I would guess, that we saw for this particular plant. So hashtag not rare again um, for this. And actually I got at seven new locations for it as well, including all the way up into Hamilton and Wayne counties. So that was really exciting for that one. It really uh, increased the known information of the distribution on this plant. So, and then I try to remember when I can to get a selfie with all the rare plants, but uh, I did miss some this year. Oh, and then Styrax too, which is really cool, is it has stacked buds. So Oh, that's right. The uh, pointer doesn't work on this screen, but you can see there's there's a bud above, and then there's a little bit of one below it, and sometimes there's even a third. Uh, nothing else, you know, no other tree or shrub that I know, of, especially in Illinois, grows like that. So even without leaves, they're really distinct with the stacked buds. So that was neat to figure out and see. Now here's another one: buffalo clover, Trifolium reflexum, is only known at three locations in southern Illinois, all in Jackson County including Giant City State Park. In fact, that's where this picture was taken because this really responds to fire. It's a biennial. And so after a burn, a lot of the first year plants come up and that's what all these little clover leaves are. So it really responded well, but it's hard to count little stems like that. So we counted 
flowering individuals. Uh, Jen and I actually went out in May and did the monitoring, and then we followed up again with the with a larger group. But in any event, we had 287 flowering clumps of the buffalo clover. Uh, there's another site where it grows at where there's a few and they don't bloom. And then I found some at Touch of Nature um, when they were, you know, they built the bike trails recently and they contracted me to do rare plant surveys before they put the trail in in case there were any rare plants in the way. There were no rare plants known, uh, at least threatened and endangered from Touch of Nature until I found the buffalo clover there, I found it in three locations. So, uh, you know, Dr. Ruffner does the fire at SIU and he's going to be out there this spring burning these areas. Because actually two of the locations I found in 2019 were not there this year. So we're going to try and do some restoration and see if we can get them to come back. Because this is actually quite rare in Southern Illinois and probably the most of it's here at Giant City. Now, nine bark is another shrub. This is kind of the thing, you know, you go farther north, you can find nine bark around, but in Southern Illinois, rare. And so there's a site in Polk County where I encountered it for the first time, not quite blooming. And then here in Jackson County, in fact, very close to where we are right now on private land, uh, we encountered some. And that's the, those are the only two places I've ever seen this in Southern Illinois, Polk County and Jackson County. But you can, you know, purchase this and, you know, landscape with it. It's really a beautiful shrub. I just think it's really interesting how rare it is in our, our area. And this is also very not rare, but such a neat looking flower that I decided to include. It looks like a little saxophone. Of course, this is pipe vine related to Dutchman's pipe, formerly Aristolochia, now it's Indotica, Serpentaria. So I have ongoing research going on at Trail of Tears uh, State Forest where they're doing the let the sun shine in and they're doing burning and thinning and all sorts of things to increase ground layer vegetation. And so I've surveyed it three times. The most common plant, is poison ivy. <laughs> Second is Virginia creeper. And third is pipe vine. And they grow single stems. They're very, um, yeah, you don't see them in big patches, but it's everywhere. It's really, really common if you're looking um, for pipe vine. Of course, we have the pipe vine swallowtail uh, butterfly that is the host plant for this. Uh, this was kind of neat too. Again, my friend drives around everywhere. He said, oh, there's green flower milkweed on Route 13, right? You know where that Hux is um, in Camp, uh, Carterville? Like right there. And this is this is not, doesn't have much of a distribution in Illinois either. It's mostly just north of Southern Illinois. You call like South Central, the Illinois Till Plain, like um, <clears throat> Perry County and across to the east. So not this far south, but here it is in, I guess it was Williamson County, <clears throat> maybe Jackson, I think it was Williamson. But any event, that was really neat to see it along the road. And actually, Travis went out and wanted to photograph it and saw the mowers coming down the lane wow. and was trying to contact the road commissioner and this and that and had his uh, girlfriend come out and help with their sister. He's like, I gotta go, but like, we need to make sure these don't get mowed. And the mowers were cool. They said, hey, can you not mow these? And they were like, right on. So they mowed around them, that's cool. Um, so they were allowed to flower and presumably set seed, but. Not common. You don't see this one really around here very much. Full Hill Prairie up in Monroe, you can see that. Now I'm cheating a little bit here. I took this picture in Indiana. This is in the Indiana Dunes, but it's so awesome. I just felt like I had to include it. Um, this is the Pink Lady Slipper Orchid. We used to have these in Illinois up in like Lake County, LaSalle County, I think. A few counties, but they have, they're, they're considered extirpated now. They haven't been seen in the wild in a long time, but they're beautiful. And it's worth including that one. There's another picture there. It was funny, we were at this site, we kind of had special access because they have a gate and we were there after hours, but my friend was like, don't worry, I can swing by and get the key and we'll take you there. And I'm photographing like one little pink lady slipper and he's like, just wait, just wait. <laughs> and then of course we come across the full patch of them. Now here's the shining false indigo bush. It's kind of a, uh, you know, you're like, wow, what is it? Amorpha nitens. Uh, Amorpha fruticosa is much more common false indigo bush. These are very similar, but this only, there's only four places where this grows. And I'd never seen it in flower. I'd seen it in fruit. To me, the key to identification is in fruit. So we returned there this year to get some in flower picks. If you know lead plant, it's related to lead plant. The flowers look just like it. But look at the fruits. They're kind of like a D shape and they have some, you know, warts on them. 
a sort of key to identification versus a morpho fruticosa, which is somewhat similar. Um, so we went to a few spots for that. And that was really kind of a neat one to see in flower finally. And then Indian pink, of course, always beautiful to see. Usually have red flowers. I threw this in there because we saw this sort of albino version, with white and yellow instead of red and yellow. You know, a lot of the flower, wildflowers that have colors often do pr produce a white form. So it's not that unusual, but I had not seen white Indian pink before. So that was kind of kind of neat thing to see. And then right next to it was the purple milkweed. Again, not super uncommon, but I liked the photo because it has the monarch caterpillar there in the background. You know, when I started giving these presentations, I was using my fancy camera and it really was about photography and, and the photo, you know, the photo and the occurrence. But it's just too easy now to take photos with your cell phone. So not all the photos are the most amazing photo. I'm talking more about the occurrence than the spectacular photography. Um, but really, iPhones do do quite amazing work. So I just use that almost exclusively these days. Now, this is another sedge, a grass-like plant that I had never seen before, Carex cherokeeensis. This was a new site for it. Um, so that was exciting to go out with Travis and Nick and learn this plan and get an ID for it for the first time. Took a collection there, the Cherokee sedge, which may become listed in Illinois at some point. See, the thing that's going on in Southern Illinois that's kind of cool is, the, the, I shouldn't say that's cool climate change, but the implication of climate change in Southern Illinois is that we're at the Northern edge of the range for species that are more common farther South. So as our climate warms, those species are moving north. And so our rare plants are becoming more common to some extent because of the changing climate. Now in Northern Illinois, the same thing is happening. Things that are rare there are disappearing because they're also um, moving farther north with climate change. But in Southern Illinois, we may actually benefit in that regard. Um, here's another spleenwort fern, a splenium. This is the Bradley spleenwort fern. And we were actually going to the, another species at this site and stumbled upon, upon a new location for this. And that actually became a theme for the summer. We would go to a known spot to find something previously located there. And we'd find one, two, three, four, five other things along the way that were not documented or were, but we didn't know were there or whatever. So that really made it fun that we're like one, we just did one rare species today, that was a bad day. <laughs> Normally we got you know up to six or even eight, nine, I think a couple times, but there's the Bradley spleen ward. I know some of these pictures are like, they're only a mother could love kind of thing, right? There's been, <laughs> but the thing here is you can see on the, on the left picture is the rachis, which is the stem. It's black for a little bit of the length, but not the entire length, it turns green. So that's kind of an identification clue for this somewhat, um, you know, easily mistaken fern. And then along the, at this site too, we had the beautiful Carolina thistle. So there are some things that are not listed as endangered or threatened in Illinois, but are tracked by either Plants of Concern or the Shawnee National Forest. The Shawnee National Forest does track Carolina thistle. It blooms in May. You know, most of our thistles are much later in the year. Um, so that's one way to separate it out, but it is a quite beautiful flower. It's kind of like the plantain, you know, you're like, thistle is a lawn weed. But we actually have rare thistles too in Illinois. But what we were going to see at this site was the Mies milkweed. And I think this is the only federally listed plant. I'm sure it's the only federally listed plant in Shawnee National Forest. I think it might be the only one across Southern Illinois. I was trying to think of other plants in Southern Illinois that are federally listed and I, I didn't come up with any. But this one is federally threatened, you know, one of our rarest milkweeds. And it is extant here at this site. Um, there's essentially three mature plants that bloom every year. They don't often set seed because with milkweeds, they're inbred, basically. There's not enough genetic diversity to create viable seed. Um, and there's also probably a pollinator um, influence as well, what's pollinating them. Um, so that's a limiting thing because they've actually supplemented a lot of new individuals and they just, they die or they don't fruit or really flower either. So this is really, really rare in our region. Now, another one here, this was, um, this is actually kind of exciting uh, at Pleasant Valley Hill Prairies, which they're not Hill Prairies, they're limestone glades, but Pleasant Valley, it's um, north of Eddyville in Polk County. And I, I also have research going on there um, where we're looking at the vegetation response to thinning and burning. And this showed up this year. I've been there, you know, studying it for several years and I've never seen the shrubby sundrops there, the Enothera fruticosa. 
in full bloom. So that was exciting to see something something new show up in response to the restoration efforts there. And actually, Carex nigro marginata we found here as well. So uh, another rare plant do um, in response to the restoration. Now I showed the timber rattlesnake earlier, venomous snake. We have three species that are venomous in Southern Illinois. Here's another, the cotton mouth. We did find, you know, cotton mouths are pretty common if you're in the right habitat. If you're where they live, they're not hard to find by any means, but they're very restricted to the southernmost part of Illinois where we have our coastal plain swamps. But there is the cotton mouth. And I have a, something, a little something later of that too. So as I mentioned, I didn't do as much travel this year, partly because I took a full-time job in Southern Illinois. So that kept me local, um, but also with the pandemic and things, I wasn't doing as many programs and workshops and travel, but I did have funding to do some natural area workshops, which I have funding to do those again this year. So I did those in May. I did one in Southern Illinois. I did one in Nechusa grasslands. And this is at Nechusa, which is owned by the Nature Conservancy, a nice big prairie restoration. So there's the group there. We did some uh, botanical sampling, and that was really neat. And what was cool was, so in the middle of the photo are, is Bill and Susan Kleiman, and they run the place. They've been there 20 plus years. And so they're friends of mine. And, uh, you know, they've introduced bison at the site. So you can't really just go walk anywhere anymore. You, you have to you're, stay behind the fence. But if you know the person who runs the joint and, you know, you get special access. So we drove in to do the sampling, and the bison were on the road. We had to kind of like slowly advance and get them to move. And so we got really close up photos and video of bison there at the preserve, which I thought was really special. And then another site we visited up there, this would have been, this would be in Ogle County, um, is a privately owned prairie that was not known until um, sort of the last 20 years. You know, we think we have a pretty good idea where all the best parts of Illinois remain, but of course there's always stuff still to find. And this was one, it's actually um, owned by a woman named Sherry. So they call it Sherry's Prairie. It's kind of a good name. And it has Phlox maculata there, which is, um, I don't think it's listed in Illinois, but I've never seen it before in Illinois. Very beautiful plant. It grows in these uh, sedge meadows. And so here's another photo of the beautiful flocks. You know, we have several flock species around here, but they don't, they don't look like this. They don't have a long panicle of flowers. They're more flat topped and such. So this is a little bit different. Uh, maculata, of course, means spotted. If you think of immaculate, is unblemished. So maculata is spotted and it has yellow or um, purple spots along the stem. So hence that name. And then also while I was up there in sand country, this was actually in Lee County. Uh, Amboy Marsh is owned by the Illinois Audubon and it's an awesome site and we saw sand milkweed bloom there which is also not rare in Illinois but very restricted we don't have a lot of sand really at the surface so it's if you find sandy areas you can find the sand milkweed another kind of a neater looking one and then this year um, I've never seen blue hearts in Illinois before I've seen them in Indiana and they are actually a threatened species now and up in Monroe County we were monitoring for them and found several new to us or undocumented locations for it and, you know, hundreds of plants. And when they're blooming, they're tall, they're pretty obvious to see and count. And so that was really cool to get to know this one a little bit better, this beautiful wildflower of our hill prairies. And then while we were in that area, um, this is another wildflower. I've never seen this before in Illinois or anywhere. Uh, Matilia decipiens. How I can get my captions back. Well, I'll have to read them to you. If you watch the video, they will be there. But this is climbing milkweed, Matilia, Decipiens. There's three species. They really only can tell them when they're in flower. And what you see is that the petals are a little wider and they kind of get wider as they extend their length, where obliqua is a similar one and it has you know the opposite. But we went to 10 spots that were documented, five of them were erroneous, and then five of them were confirmed. So we have five confirmed locations for this and less than 50 flowering individuals per location. So to me, that's rare. That's truly endangered species, uh, the Matilia decipiens. And so the idea with plants of concern is that we will continue year after year, either the staff themselves or more ideally a volunteer will go uh, and see how these do over time. Just gorgeous, gorgeous. It's a vine, really beautiful vine. 
Now, another plant I've never seen this before in my life, and I knew where it grew, but I just never made it out there. Uh, Chris Evans, actually, and John Van Dyke found this um, in 2013. And I went to a lot of the other sites that I knew for this, and there weren't there at any of them. So as far as I'm aware, this is there's only one place for this. Um, this is related to Rattlesnake Master. It's Euryngium prostratum. And they're small. I don't know if you can tell with my hand there. They're really little blue flowers. And it's really kind of neat to see. And just one spot left in Illinois. So truly rare indeed. And then I wanted to show a picture of the hill prairie. So what's cool is I haven't spent a lot of time in Monroe County. It's probably about an hour and a half from here to get to Fultz Hill Prairie. So that's, a, that's far. Um, so I haven't spent a ton of time up there, but I think we made six or seven trips up there through the season. And this is at one of the hill prairies in that region. Very steep, very steep and hard to manage. But here's Travis out in the hill prairie botanizing. So we saw a lot of neat things there. We took a volunteer to help us count. And I kind of like this photo. He's looking at a plant there. And of course, down in the bottoms of the Mississippi River Valley, you can see what's happened to the nature there. It's all farmland. But the hill prairies are perched up high above. They're steep. You know, they're tough to, to graze. They're tough to do anything with, which is why they have persisted. And all along that bluff road and that bluff corridor, you can see high quality hill prairies present. And one of the rare plants that grows there, Monroe County is like, a whole nother world. You get species there we don't have down here are really that common in the rest of Illinois, including this uh, slender heliotrope, Heliotropium tenellum is this one. And it's just a little tiny plant. And you look there and you think, oh, I think I see like a dozen. But when you start to pin flag each one individually, we counted like 600. I mean, they're way more there than it looks like. And again, this is something I thought was really, really rare. And it is kind of in its distribution, but there's a lot of plants that persist there. Now, this one here, grass-leaved lily, Stenanthium uh, graminium. I have never seen flowering in Illinois before. And again, we went to all the known <clears throat> locations and found it at almost all of them. Uh, there are a few we didn't, but very excitingly, the same volunteers that told me about the Sanandra in Union County were hiking here at Giant City State Park. And in fact, they didn't uh, inform me. They put it on, uh, I administer the Illinois Botany Group on Facebook, and they put it on the Illinois Botany and said, what is this plant? I mean, it's tall. It's weird looking. It's conspicuous. And so it's really obvious. And, and Chris Evans beat me to the punch and he commented, oh, that's Denanthium. It's rare. Where did you see it? And so they told me I went and there were 12 here in the park that bloomed. Uh, really, really neat and definitely truly rare as well. There's 10, 12 locations maybe, um, but not a lot of plants. So that was really neat to see. And then this one here, I wish you could see the label. I don't really know why that's doing that, but um, this is Galactia molenbrockii. So Dr. Robert Molenbrock, he wrote the vascular floor of Illinois. He taught at SIU, botany professor. He lives in Carbondale. I visit with him somewhat regularly. Um, this one of his former students reclassified this genus, which was Dio Dioclea before. Now it's Galactia molenbrachii. Yes, we named it after him. So that's really cool. And you can see it. It's the dark green photo in the photo, uh, dark green leaves. It's a pea. So they have trifoliate leaves, leaves of three. So I thought it was kind of neat how conspicuous they looked here in the photo. This only grows in Massac County along like near Metropolis. Um, so that was kind of neat. We went to go see those. We went to all the known locations. I think there were eight clustered around, you know, Metropolis essentially, but this is what it looks like. Um, it's called Boinkins Milk Pea, but I, if you could see the label, I labeled it Molenbrock's Milk Pea. This is Molenbrockii. That was kind of neat. Never seen that before in my life. Another Illinois lifer from this year. And this one as well. Travis actually is a credit for this one. I, I'd heard of this species. I'd never seen it. I wasn't really sure what it looked like. And here we are at a swamp and we find Carex gigantea. So again, the key to identification sometimes is not only the perigenium, which is the fruit. Those are on the right, those large you know, fruit sacks. That's the fruit inside. But the akeen is the actual fruit and the seed is in the akeen. You got to look at the akeens and what their shape is. And these are like flat across the top and real triangular and really knobby. And that makes them distinct. And then if you look at the spike there on the left, the, the beak of the perigenia comes out almost straight horizontal. 
and they're big clumps of leaves. So it's distinct. We ended up having two new locations for that this year. So that was fun to find. And then it's somewhat similar cousin here, it's Carex lupuliformis. So Carex, um, Carex um, lupulina is very common in wherever it's wet all throughout Southern Illinois. But this is lupuliformis, basically saying form like lupulina. So they're very similar. And it also has very knobby akeens. So you see it's much more diamond shaped. It's not flat on the top like the previous photo, but it's got those really distinct you know, knobs or knees that kind of stick out like this. But lupulina can be varying in its knobbiness. And so a lot of the specimens that were turned in labeled lupuliformis, the expert went through and annotated and said, no, most of these are actually lupulina. So we've learned that it's actually quite rare or we don't know because a lot of the previous specimens were mis id So we found this at one site, it's actually um, the Heron Pond, in the Heron Pond area. Um, and so that was really exciting to find. That's the only spot that I know of it for sure. So we're, we're, we're trying to learn more information on the distribution of that one. Okay, and another one here we have wood fern is the, I don't know what to do about that. I'm sorry, that's a bummer. Uh, but Dryoptera celsa is this one. It only occurs one place. There's two clumps of it there. I've never seen it before. Again, another one I've never seen. So we went to, to find it. This was a day where I think we had like eight rare plants that we monitored. Um, so that was kind of cool. There's Nick in the background being like, yeah, what's up? We got it. The wood fern, the selfie picture there with that. So that was kind of neat. And then here is one of the really one of the you know more like mind blowing things that I've experienced this year was Clotanthera flava variety flava. It's called the tubercled orchid, and it is state threatened. I knew of six locations for it in the database, and then uh, a friend found a new site, and then another person found another new one. We went to all eight of them, and at a lot of them. There were uncountable numbers like this picture. This only shows some of it. You can see the, you know, the yellow spikes. It was just huge patches, 10,000 plants in one spot. So this was the kind of thing where at the end of counting them all, I was like, I hope I never see this plant again. <laughs> so, so much of it. I had dreams about finding this plant. Um, but it had, I don't, and that's what I want to find out. Did it have a really good year this year? Or, um, you know, is it becoming more common because of climate change and things? So it's only in Pope and Johnson County and Massac. So just a few counties for that one. So I, I wonder, is this really rare? It may not be. We'll see if, as the years go by. If it, if it stays in these kinds of numbers, I would say it's not that rare. Just like this one, we have some things that are listed. They're becoming more common, particularly in the South as the climate warms. This is called the squirting cucumber, Belothria pendula. Uh, I think I have 12 new locations for this. I mean, this is gonna come off the list. It's, it's really becoming much more common. And it's a vine and it's got the little fruits that dangle down like cucumbers there. So that was cool as fine. And then uh, meadow beauty, this is the dull meadow beauty, Arexia mariana. Also beautiful wildflower. I don't have a good handle on the distribution. I didn't get to enough locations this year, but this is actually a crab orchard. It was a little bit there and that was kind of neat to see close to home. So, and then things like Canada milk vetch. Like I said, the bottom is one eye in the ditch. So Travis and I are driving up to Fultz Hill Prairie. And we're like, whoa, that's the cool thing about Southern Illinois. If you see something cool, you can just stop and throw it in reverse. <laughs> when I work up in Cook County, no, you got to take you 20 minutes to get back around where you were. But we saw the, this Canada milk fetch and pulled over. I've never seen this plant in Southern Illinois. I can't name anywhere else it grows in the region, you know, that I delineated as Southern Illinois. So that seems really cool. We spotted that. But one of the coolest things we had this whole summer was the crested coral root orchid. Hex electris spicata. It's parasitic. It is not green. It cannot make its own food. So it's uh, somewhat conspicuous when it blooms. It's very finicky. It does not come back in the same spot every year. You can go in somewhere and find one one year and find 50 the next. So we went to all the known sites. I think there were 15 sites, uh, no, eight sites in five counties, 15 subpopulations. We found it at every single one. We found at least one plant at every single one. And we counted a total of 487 plants. 
So in five counties, to me, that is rare. That is a rare plant. And so again, it's an orchid. They're finicky. I'm going to be see next year, you know, through the next few years, really get an idea for this plant. Because one of the things that's strange is it associates with grassland openings. It associates with hill prairies and limestone glades, but it rarely actually grows in the opening. It grows in the woods around it. And so it's like, well, if it likes the woods, there, we have tons of that. Why is it? Why is it only near the glade? And at one of the sites, they had burned the woods and it's the, the, the canopy is so dense that once they burn all the leaves, it was literally bare ground with a few green plants, but mostly bare ground. And then we counted over a hundred of these blooming. I mean, you could, in that kind of uh, circumstance, you could see them from, you know, hundred feet away. And you're like, whoa, there's some over there. So that was really, really cool. And there, I just think they're really gorgeous and see a nice clump of like eight of them or so blooming. It's, it was really special. So that was fun. I'm definitely going to write up a paper about the occurrence of that uh, in, uh, you know, all the known places here in Southern Illinois. Oh my gosh, I keep repeating myself. This was another like super cool thing that happened this summer. I also had a grant to look at the distribution of kidney leaf mud plantain, Heteranthera reniformis. Reniformis, like renal, like kidney, it's a kidney leaf. This is an annual, it grows mud plantain, it grows in shallow mud pools. And I'd never seen this before. And I actually found a new location in Pope County last year, vegetatively. And I thought, can I be confident this is it? You know, I don't know. They has really kidney shaped leaves. Um, actually, the expert confirmed it for me, but I went back this year and saw them in flower. But the interesting thing about this is, so seeing them in flower, they have white flowers, they're small, they have a little green, yellow throat to them. They're distinct for sure from because they're a similar species that are not as rare. Anyway, there were five known spots. I went to all of them or somebody went to, you know, almost all of them or best we could and they weren't at any of them. But I found four new locations, three in Pope County and one in Alexander. If we didn't find any new locations this year, we would have said this plant is gone as far as we know. It's not at any previously known location. So not only that, it grows in, so where I found it, three, the three places in Polk County were rutted out by ATVs. They were, they were holding water, mud and water created by an ATV, and that's where this the Illinois endangered plant is growing. Really cool. But in Alexander County, we went in looking for something else, and it was along this uh, oxbow swamp where when the, you know, later in the year, this year was kind of dry towards the end of the year and the water levels recede. So it, 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 it wants sunlight, totally open and exposed mud. This is the scene on the, on the left there. I mean, all around this wetland, thousands, you can't count this many stems or plants, just thousands and thousands. And then you see them again in bloom. So it was just like, wow, no idea. Uh, you know, learning more about this species distribution in Illinois. So we confirmed it extant in Alexander and Pope. There's old records for Union, haven't found any in Union County yet. Um, but another survey we came across this fern company called Goldie's Fern, Dryopteris goldiana. Also kind of cool. If you know the common uh, marginal shield fern, Dryopteris marginalis, it's somewhat similar, but marginalis, as the name implies, it has the sori along the margins or the edge of the leaf. These are not, these are definitely close to the mid vein. So that makes a difference also about this tall, it's a big frond. Um, and I've not seen this very much in Southern Illinois. I've seen it at Rocky Bluff and this is in Polk County. And that's the only two places I can think of. So that was kind of neat to stumble upon. And then the Clematis crispa, beautiful flower. Again, one that I thought there were like 12 plants and we went to one site and counted over a hundred of them. So they didn't seem as rare as uh, what they, you know, I thought they were at one time, but beautiful wildflower and kind of some interesting looking fruits there on the clematis. That was Alexander County only for that one. And then since I was talking about mud plantains, um, this is the most common mud plantain we have, Heteranthera limosa. And what's really cool about it is you can see it can have white or blue flowers to it. And these were growing pretty much side by side. Um, and so you see the leaf there, it's not kidney shaped, it's not heart shaped leaf base. So it has a little different leaf, um, but that's just a beautiful little mud plantain. And these bloom in the morning, you gotta go out and see them by mid afternoon. They're 
they're not blooming anymore. And, and these flowers are probably about like, you know, an inch maybe where the, the previous one was, you know, maybe a, a quarter of an inch. So these are much bigger flowers. Now, another cool thing was the hydrolia. It's kind of hard to see here, but there are blue flowers all throughout this plant. It's, it's also a, um, an annual. And I'd only seen it at one place. In fact, I was the discoverer turned in that location in the Cache River wetlands. So we returned with the volunteer and you see Travis here with the plant. <laughs> Again, like uncountable numbers. There are, we ended up going to four locations for it, found them at all of them, but that's it. In fact, one of them was on private land. That was kind of exciting. So Jackson, Johnson, Pope, and Pulaski we confirmed extant populations for hydrolia, and that's it. So I do think even though there's large patches at a couple of these sites, this is a rare plant in Southern Illinois. Hydrolia uniflora in the water leaf family. Really cool. And then actually heading down to one of the sites, this is our, this rounds out the venomous snake uh, uh, species in Illinois, Southern Illinois. Um, this is the copperhead, the Kistrodon contortrix. Beautiful specimen right across the road. And then this one here, um, I thought was a pretty photo, Cave Creek Glade here in Johnson County, the Cache River Wetlands, a limestone glade, amazing views from Cave Creek Glade. I wanted to share that one. And then, uh, so Gretel uh, Kiefer and her assistant, Katie Cusera, are the Northern Illinois Plants of Concern people. And they came down to help us out in September. And this was our first day out in the field. We got soaking wet in the rain. Um, we were actually looking for hydrolia here as well. And we found some. So there's Nick and Travis and Katie and Gretel. Kind of neat. And then, so we took them to go to some really cool spots. Now, this is Grantsburg Swamp. Grantsburg Swamp is in Grantsburg, just east of the town of Grantsburg. Highway 146 kind of cuts right through it, unfortunately. But big swamp, Shawnee National Forest, the coolest place. Oh, my gosh. I love Grantsburg Swamp. But Grantsburg is kind of a litmus test for botanists because there are a lot of cotton mouths. Mm -hmm. The terrain is very challenging. It's very beautiful, but it's very wet. A lot of our swamps don't get really more than knee deep or you can avoid where it's deeper, but here you gotta be ready to get wet. So you see kind of the scene here, there's trees falling over. Sometimes what looks like just a little channel of water can actually be really deep. Um, so it's really slow going. In fact, Dr. Mullenrock told me it took him five graduate students before someone would do the flora of Grantford Swamp because they'd go in and see the cotton mouth and say, I'm out of here. And I think we saw five or six this day. In fact, one really big one right on a log and you're looking at it and think that's really neat. And then it slithered into the water and you're standing in the water and you're kind of like, where did it go? But you know, snakes don't want to mess with humans. They, they're going, you just go the other way. So I'm going to head out this way. So I don't think there's too much worry there, but Mark Basinger who did the um, uh, surveys here for the Cheyenne National Forest said he was here one time and he was standing there and Jody Shimp was with him and he said, Mark, don't look down, don't move. And of course, what does he do? Looks down and there, a cotton mouth had surfaced in between his legs in the water. And he was like, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but Grantsburg is really, really cool. Um, and you can see the cypress here. The, the white parts here are actually a gall. There's a, a several insects that uh, make galls on cypress trees. And they kind of, they look like a lot, often people say flowers. The cypress trees are flowering because cypress are conifers. They don't produce flowers. So that wouldn't make sense, but they, they do have these structures on them that make them look neat. And then also really cool is um, this, if you could read the label, it says great white lettuce and nebulous uh, crepidinus, crepidinus. This, um, you know, we have several lettuce species. This is not that uncommon to find leaves. It never flowers. I've literally never seen it in flower. And we're walking along Highway 146 at Grantsburg Swamp. And here's one, you know, seven feet tall in full bloom. I didn't even know what it was at first. I'm like, what in the world? So I've never seen those flowering before. Really need to see the grape white lettuce. And then here, another lifer. This is snow screw stem. It's an aster. It is called Melanthera nibia. And it grows down along the Ohio River. And it's just a couple spots there, nowhere else, Massac County. 
So I went down there this year. It's growing along the road. It's growing along the river. Again, big patches, but very localized. I've never seen it before, full bloom. In fact, what's interesting is I was just down in Florida. We just got home on Friday. And we were down in the Keys and, and such. And this plant was all over the place. And I thought, well, that's really neat because I just learned it or seen it for the first time in Illinois this year. So very definitely rare, although, um, you know, we counted a few hundred plants probably. Here's another picture and one with the little pollinator on it. Beautiful, beautiful wildflower. And this one here is called Lady's Eardrops. I was asking my wife last night, what, what's an like, eardrop? Earring, I don't know, I guess. But anyway, this is in the um, the uh, Polygonaceae, which is the um, smartweed family. And this is southern sixth of Illinois only, and only in the coastal plain. And it's fairly uh, common throughout. We went to a lot of swamp sites. This is like the dominant plant, but only in extreme southern part of Illinois. And I think the flowers are pretty neat. So I threw that in the mix, and then we saw these two eastern box turtles. The, the, the male on the top there is clearly saying, <clears throat> excuse me, you mind? <laughs> As they're uh, hanging out there. Uh, and then I wanted to show this picture of Carex intumescens and Carex gray eye. These were all from the Grantsburg Swamp Day where we were with the, the people from up north. You see on the left side, that's Carex intumescens, <clears throat> the perigenia. You can see that the base is very round, not hairy. And then you look at the one on the right, that's Carex gray eye, which is super common. And it's got hairy perigenia, and it's got more of a club-shaped um, or sort of wedge-shaped tapered look to it. So this is only interesting in the sense that they look kind of similar together. And this was an epiphany that I had uh, this day where I'm like, wow, the gray eye is hairy. And the other one's not. That makes it really simple. So I thought it was interesting to conclude the differences there on those two similar ones. I should also say, because Carex intumescens is state-threatened, and it's another one that's becoming much more common. And as we learn more about it, it will probably come off the list. And that's one that I'm hoping to work on next year. And then while we were in the swamp, um, encountered this gorgeous caterpillar, which is the banded sphinx moth. Not only had I not seen this colorful caterpillar before, but I had never seen the plant it was on before, which my friend tipped me off to the previous week and had sent me a photo from Vermette Lake and said, hey, you've seen this uh, Ludwigia leptocarpa as the hairy primrose will. And I said, I, no, I don't know, I haven't seen that. We're at Grantsburg, here it is blooming all over the place. And this caterpillar is the host plants are the onagraceae, of which this is included. So it's on the host plant, both of them never seen before. Very showy, very neat. So that was cool in that, that area. Now here we have an animal, an insect called a lichen grasshopper. And lichen grasshoppers are very camouflaged as the name implies. Has anybody spotted the, it yet there? I'm gonna show you here with a little red circle. It's right there. <laughs> And a little larger photo, oh, yeah. you can actually see the grasshopper. So typically you don't see them when they're not moving. You, you, you walk through and they fly and then you see where they land and try to get a photo. So they're really neat little critters to find out in these sandstone glades, the liking grasshoppers. And then here we have a wild bean. And these actually make a string bean. It looks like a long string bean. And Strophostyles is the genus. There are three in this, in this uh, genus in Illinois, and I'd seen the other two, but I'd not seen this one, which was Umbelata. Very beautiful wildflowers. This is in Polk County. And here is the difference between this and the more common uh, Strophostyles helvula, and it's the calyx lobe. So right here, that calyx lobe is half as long as the tube. So very sort of inconspicuous minor feature, but that I wanted to show you is what you clue in on to um, accurately identify this species, the wild bean. In, in that same area, we're going into these seep springs, acid seeps. You know, in most of Illinois, we have calcareous seeps, which means they're alkaline, they're basic in pH, but in Southern Illinois, we have acidic seeps. And in a lot of them, the little wet, we get the screw stem. Bartonia paniculata. And that's what this little plant is. Um, if you've ever seen uh, pine weed, Hypericum gentianoides, 
and you think gentianoides, what's a, what's gentian like with the pine weed? Well, this is it. This is in the gentian family and it's saying it looks like Bartonia. It should be Bartonioides, I think, but what, in any event, uh, this is a little inconspicuous flowering plant. And what you want to see, there's, there's two species and this one is the more rare one and it has alternate leaves. So you kind of see there's a leaf at the top of my finger and the next one's on the other side of the stem a little bit lower. And if you look at the ridges of the stem, you see how it kind of curls a little bit, curves, that's the screw stem part. It actually is a curved stem. So just a little inconspicuous plant, but well, we kind of like 300 in this spot. Um, so that was really kind of, kind of neat to see. It's a plant at first where you're like, I don't see any. And then you're like, oh, there's one, oh, there's one, oh, there's another one. <laughs> so it makes it fun to find. Now this I had never seen before either. This is uh, Eupatorium hisopifolium, I believe only known from Polk County. And we were in there with a few people and this was a known location, so I got a picture. Well, then the next week we were at another site nearby and uh, Travis and I found more. And it was not known from that site. And I took a picture, I put it on iNaturalist and someone who is, um, knew more about this than me basically said, I think it's actually Eupatorium torianum which is formerly a subspecies of Hisopifolium, which is not known from Illinois. Now, I don't have a collection, but that could possibly be a state record then. State records for native species are really hard to get. We really, really know what is growing in Illinois. So that is like another, the holy, holy grail of botanists. We wanna find something that's native that has not been documented in the state before, and this could be it. So we'll follow up with that next year and see. Of course, you know, the white snake root, um, which is super common. This is, you know, related to that, the Eupatoriums. Joe Pieweed used to be in that genus, so common group. Now, here is another really fun find we had this year. It's called Nut Rush. Anything with the name Rush is probably not a true Rush. <laughs> a lot of things are sedges that are called Rushes. So Nut Rushes are sedges that should be called Nut Sedges. But in any event, they have these Akeens that are really conspicuous. They're white and they're hard. And so we went to uh, a site with Jody Shimp where he had found Scleria oligantha in 1994 when he was doing his thesis. And that was new to the state. And he was showing it to us and I thought, I've seen this plant before. I saw this plant in 2019 in Alexander County. Mm -hmm. So the next week, Travis and I, my wife Susan, we went and we found them and that was it a county record for this rare plant. And I thought, did I misidentify it when I was there in 2019? How, how did I, why was this not on my radar? So I Google Scleria oligantha and look at the images and near the top of the list is a picture on my website that I took labeled Scleria oligantha. And I thought, how did I forget about this? Well, in Molenbrock's flora, he lists this as occasional throughout the state. And that is wrong. It only was known in Pope County. So when I had seen it and identified it, I didn't think of it as rare. So I was like, okay, here's another obscure graminoid that I learned for the first time, throw it on the website and move on with your life. So I totally forgot about it. And I realized, wow, this is a county record. This is only the second place where this species grows in Illinois. Um, so that was neat to identify and confirm. And if you look at the, the collar of the Akeen, you can see it look like kind of little teeth, little tubercles around the, the collar. That is distinct for this one. Because somewhat similar, and, and also the thing here is that the, the keen is smooth, it's shiny and smooth. It's not pitted, it's not dimpled or, or papillose, it's smooth. So this is a similar one, Scleria triglomerata. It's also smooth, but look at the collar on that. That doesn't look like, it doesn't have tubercles, it's totally different. So it's, that is the way to tell these two you know, similar species apart. And so if we look at the drawing here from the floor of Missouri, you can see a nice drawing there of the two, the triglomerate on the left and the oligantha on the right. So here's triglomerate, a picture with the drawing, looks good. And then oligantha here, looks good. So that was really neat to, to see for the first time or get to know these two. In fact, there are only five sclerias in Illinois. Um, and we saw another one and then Travis went up north and saw another one and then there's one that's, that's left, we didn't see. But here's maidenhair spleenwort fern, one I've always liked to see. Don't confuse it with maidenhair fern. It's maidenhair spleenwort fern. Not all that rare, but fun. And then this one here is the sedum, formerly sedum. Um, it looks like what people have in their garden. 
kind of a lot, but this is a rare one. It only grows on cliffs in Pope County and Hardin County. And there was a lot of it at the site. This is sort of near Garden of the Gods. So that was fun to see a lot of that. And then we have a club moss. There's two species in Illinois, Huperzia. And this is the rare one called the cliff club moss. Um, it grows at Little Grand Canyon and Camp on Sunk and you know, other places. But what you really need to look at at this one is you look at the leaves. And for this one, that's more rare, the porophylla, the cliff club moss. Um, the leaves are widest at the base and they taper and they don't have any teeth. So lucidula is somewhat similar, but it actually gets wider as it goes towards the tip. And you can see little teeth if you look really closely. So this was fun. We went, I'm still working on this. This stays green all year round. So I pushed some stuff off for this winter. So I still have things to do. And um, we'll go after some more locations for that. But while we were in at this site, we found this gentian, which is the bottle gentian. This is actually the soap wort gentian, which we learned in a fun way, um, but also not common in Southern Illinois. This is a Northern species. There's only a few places like Lust Creek and Faulkner Tract and just a few spots to find this. And, so that was fun to see the beautiful gentian that's rare in this part. And at the same site also, first time I've seen Ilex verticillata, winter berry in Southern Illinois, just a little shrub. It's actually kind of interesting. We saw a few plants on our way in and I was like, I don't know what that is. I can't, I can't put a name on it, I don't know. And I have to tell you, I've been botanizing in Southern Illinois for like 12 years. It's pretty rare for me to look at something and just like not know at all what it is. But then we found mature ones with fruit. And I was like, oh, that's what that was, a winter berry. So that's neat to, to see finally in our region. And then, oh, kind of a bummer pick here. I had to you know, show you the reality. Sometimes we also see some really weird stuff, some messed up stuff going on. This is down in near Tams along a drainage. And the landowner just cleared all the trees along the edge of this, the the creek and of course all this is going to erode into the creek and it was really kind of sad to see and there's rare plants that's why we were here looking for rare plants so there's rare plants nearby and the land there's kind of been messed up but in the swamps there you can see get the videos cotton mouths and of course they do the little mouth opening as a defense posture so i kind of had to move towards them to get him to do it a couple times but in my experience you leave them alone, they leave you alone. So it's kind of neat to see the little video. Now, again, in the Seep Springs in Southern Pope and Massac counties, you can find some neat things like white turtle head. Now up north, you can find white turtle head in every fen and wetland, it's common. But down here, this is the only place I've ever seen it. Um, we have the pink turtle head, which is a little bit more common, but still pretty rare. But the white ones in Southern Illinois, I've never seen before blooming. So we happen to get that. But again, unfortunately at this site, the, the natural area, it goes a little bit onto private land. The private land has switched hands a few times and the current landowner is logging it heavily. And they, you know, when they log, they only take the trunk, they cut the top and they let it fall. So all the tops were dropped into the seat, into the high quality area. And so there are a number of rare plants here. And this was one of the nicest seeps we had prior to this destruction. So it'd be interesting to see what happens and preliminary, preliminary results don't look good. And on the way out of this site, we haven't, oh yeah, I guess I got a couple more yet. We went on from here to another natural area and we found another square area, the nut rush. But look at this one, it's got bumps all over it. It's not smooth. So that's Scleria possiflora, um, which is Illinois endangered. And one that we're going to look into as being perhaps more common than we thought. But see, it's got the little tubercles at the, at the collar, like oligantha, but it's not smooth. It's got bumps all over it. But this is the picture I wanted to say. This is what met us at our car when we walked through. Now, we had permission. We inquired to make sure it was a county road and that the landowner knew we were going to be through there. Um, but he still called the police on us. And the cop, the, this guy was cool, luckily, and, you know, he let us go. We, we told him, we showed him our tracks on our phone, you know, hey, we didn't trespass. And he was like, okay, you're good. Um, but that was sort of an interesting uh, event. In fact, this guy was from Olive Branch. He drove over to, I mean, we were in Polk County. He drove over an hour to come over and mess around with this. But in my experience, if you work for a 
government agency and you're working with a landowner, they're going to do whatever you want. They really like that, like try to make sure the landowner relations are all, you know, cool and they want to please the landowner for better or worse, you know, depending on the situation. But he was cool. Nothing resulted from that. So we moved on. Uh, but here's another really rare plant, again, only known in Hardin County. We really need to get a bunch of botanists to go to Hardin County and hit it hard. And I think we could find more. Um, so there are six locations for this oval-leaved catch fly, Silene oveda. So we have the Silene stellata, starry campion, which is somewhat similar, and very common. Uh, but this one only in Hardin County, six sites, but a new one was found this year. And there were a few hundred there. So I had seen it before, but I didn't have a good picture in flower. And so I was able to get some, some nice photos here of this very rare plant, one county only in Illinois. In fact, it's not very common throughout its whole range. So that's kind of neat. And then again, back to the Styrax. Oh, this is because we went up to Kankakee County. Styrax Americana, I told you I was doing all the known locations. And if you look at the range map here, it's, you know, it's a Southern species and it's a few sites in Southern Illinois and then all the way up in Kankakee County at the Moments Wetlands. So we were able to find a few there. They didn't look like they were doing very well, but we did find some. You can see they're also across the border in Indiana. Um, but also in this spot, we found Macania scandens, which is climbing hemp weed. Again, distribution, it's a Southern species. But there it is up in, you know, Northwest Indiana and Kankakee County. Of course, this is the great, you know, the great marsh, the Kankakee Sands area, formerly at least. Um, and then swamp cottonwood is another one. These are all southern swamp species that are making their range extension all the way up into Kankakee County in Illinois. So those were fun to see and to document. And while we were up there, we went to a savanna in Kankakee County, privately owned. A woman in her retirement is buying land specifically to set it aside and conserve, set it aside and, and uh, preserve it. This is Old Plainsman, which is an aster I've never seen before, another lifer plant. And then we found the sweet fern, Comptonia peregrina. And you see it's the, it's, there's a lot of it here, a big patch of it. It's not a fern. It's actually a flowering plant. So it's a misnomer, but it's called sweet fern because when you see it, you go, oh, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> There's only two places in Illinois I've ever seen it. And there was a lot of it here at this private savanna. So that was kind of kind of awesome. And then here, th these are um, chronological. So we're getting into October now. Um, but this is at Fultz Hill Prairie. They had their 50th anniversary celebration uh, in October on the 9th. So there's a beautiful picture up there from, from the Fultz Hill Prairie where we went so many times this year. And then this was another really cool thing. Like I was saying, this is a volunteer run, like sort of base program. And if you, you know, stay connected with other people out looking for plants, there's a student at SIU Forestry who's crazy about going out to find rare stuff. You know, mostly trees, but anything. And he's also like really good at mining the literature for information. So he found this report that said this plant, which is called striped wintergreen, was growing um, at this site and he went out and found it. Now, I had been, well, I've never seen this in Illinois. It's actually pretty common in like Georgia and stuff. I've never seen it in Illinois, I assumed it was gone. And he documented it as extant in Gallatin County. So Travis and I went out there to find it. There's another picture and it actually had fruit on it. So it had blooms here, blooms in June, we were there in October. So that was really cool. I would have assumed we don't have this anymore, but you know, I was tipped off by a volunteer friend, went out and found it. So that was super cool. It's, there's got to be more of it out there. We just got to look. And then uh, in my conversations with uh, Dr. Mullenbrock throughout the season, he let me know that uh, the mayor was doing this, um, you know, stars sort of uh, commemorating people who are from Murfreesboro. Um, and so along the main street there, they have a number of these and he has one. And what's interesting is his daughter has a store there and it's right in front of her store. And he said that it was not planned at all. It's just coincidence. They put it there. But we stopped by um, towards the end of our field season here to get a picture um, with Mullen Rock star, star fame. That was neat. Just a few more photos. Uh, this is called white swamp milkweed, which I thought was kind of neat. You know, most milkweeds have cottony fluff on the seeds, so they're wind dispersed, but these grow in the swamp where there's not a lot of wind. So they actually have a wind seed that's designed, you know, adapted to float on the surface of the water and be spread that way. So I thought that was kind of a neat little photo of the 
the follicles that have opened up there on that. And then I saw this really weird looking bald cypress tree down by Karnak. I can't explain how this limb is joined from one trunk to the other, uh, but there it is. And so I thought that was really a neat looking um, cypress tree there down near Karnak. And in fact, I have funding to do the big tree updates again this year. And I have like 10 new champions that I found a lot of them down in the Karnak area. Um, do you know where Big Cypress Access is, that road that goes north-south? On uh, both sides of that road, any of it that's not former field, is just huge trees in there, huge trees. So there's a number of new champions that are going to come out of that. Now, Molenbrock told me about this one. This is near Silbeck Track, which is in uh, Mermet, um, in Massac County. This beautiful, look at the shape of this tree. It's a willow oak. And it's pretty big. I measured the champion willow oak uh, last year. It's in Cobden clearly planted because that's outside of its range, but this could be a, a naturally occurring tree that's left. So I'm going to see if that's a contender, but it's just beautiful shape on that, that oak tree. And then uh, I try not to get down this uh, conversation too far, but Bell Bowl Prairie is up in Rockford. It's slated for destruction because the airport wants to expand and there's a whole issue going around it. It's been temporarily saved, but it seems due to imminent destruction, but Nearby was Harlem Hills Nature Preserve, which also has dry gravel prairie. So I went there to visit, never been there before. If you've heard of George Fell, who did our nature preserve system, and you have a biography of this book, he spent his honeymoon camped out here at the site uh, in the 50s. So that was really cool to finally see that. And then while we were there, we found the stiff aster, which I thought was a neat plant um, that I don't see in this area very much. All right, just a couple more photos. There I found nature's toilet. And I'm hanging out in the. <laughs> if you had an emergency, that actually might make a decent spot to, to take care of that. Um, and then back to Grantsburg Swamp in the fall. You know, the bald cypress, the needles turn brown and they fall off. So it's neat to revisit it. Although we were there the first week of November and we had a cold spell and I forgot my hip waders and I wore my knee boots. And I knew, like I said earlier, very wet. You're not, they're not going to be good enough. And I walked around all day with water in my knee boots, water up to my thighs, feet were numb. Small price to pay. It was still awesome. <laughs> still awesome. And what's cool about Grandsbury Swamp is you have cliffs adjacent to the swamp. And so you have this like totally, completely different habitats side by side. And so that makes it neat. And while we were there, that's when you see the Biden's bloom, the fur marigolds, full glorious bloom. And in fact, um, I've realized through Facebook and uh, talking to other people, and this is actually Biden's latest, not Cernua, which I had assumed, and not a lot is known about this species in Illinois. This clearly would be a county record for that. And I think it's more common than we know. So again, there's like still a lot of botanical questions to be answered here in Southern Illinois. And Nick, he was able to saw this big tree fall and it got under, see Nick's, he remembered his waders, he's got hip waders on, he stayed dry that day. Me, not so much. And then here we found this cool root wad that he's like, like a little cave that he was able to crawl into on this, uh, I think it's a, a maple tree there on the edge of the swamp. And then back to Hickory Bottoms for Styrax again, this is a county record. Again, I, was, I, I am coming, I got three more, I got three more picks. Um, but I want to tell you about this because I had two other people go look for Styrax with, I had a point, a discreet GPS point, and they didn't find it. And I thought, you know, I didn't think anything about, okay, it's, maybe it's gone. So I'm digging into it a little more. And I'm like, well, who found this and when? I found it there in 2010. And I turned in the report and I, and I have a picture of the shrub in fruit. And I'm like, there's no way it's still not there. So Travis and I and Catherine went back and Bobby and, no, probably see, yeah, I was with that day. And uh, the four of us are looking and we found it. And the significance of that is that this is the only Union County record for this species. So we were able to redocument the Union County Styrax. In Hickory Bottoms, if you're familiar, it's a part of the Cypress Creek. Uh, also, big trees, nice big trees in there, which, you know, we don't have a lot of anymore, including three champions we visited. This is the uh, Shag Bark Hickory champion. It's co-champion with my shag bark hickory from uh, Trail of Tears State Forest. Um, and then also near Karnak, I've never seen before until this year, water hickory, Caria aquatica. And look at that bark. Isn't that amazing? 
So they only really shag from the bottom. They don't shag on the top part of the plate. So that makes it distinct from shag bark hickory. But it also has got like a tan coloration to it. Again, this is one where you're looking through the forest. You can be like, oh, there's one over there. I see one back over there. So they really stand out. Um, and we counted like 80 around Karnak. I, I don't know anywhere else that I've seen nowhere. So um, really kind of cool to get an idea on that. So there you have it. Woo, that was a lot of plants, a lot of photos. But um, I hope you enjoyed it. Again, I'll, I'll put the recording on my YouTube channel uh, when I get a chance. And um, otherwise, uh, let me know if you're interested in any merchandise. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes. Where was that large dogwood tree? The large dogwood tree is in a little town called Texaco, which is east of uh, Dix. So high, highway, uh, the Interstate 57, there's an exit there. Um, I forget the name of the cemetery, but it's public. It's it's public cemetery. Yeah, it's not in the greatest shape. It's kind of hollow and it's lost some limbs, um, but it's over 100 years old. Wow. So it's hanging on. They were talking to me about trying to do some cabling and things. So we'll see, because it's definitely a, a treasured dream. Really cool. Is there any uh, chance with Prairie Orchard Lake being so low that there's an opportunity to do some surveying around the shorelines to see if something has been down there for all these years and might come back now? That is an excellent question. <clears throat> and um, I've thought about that and I didn't get a chance to go look. I feel like it, there's probably not like I was wondering about that, but for the heteranthera I mentioned, I'm like, wow, this mudfly is exposed. Could that have come up? But since it's underwater for so long, I, I wonder, but um, my friend that I keep talking about driving around did go in there and botanize. He didn't find anything rare, but he found a lot of interesting plants that he'd never seen before that all, you know, presumably were in the sea bank and it popped up. So yes, that is an amazing opportunity to see, uh, you know, the areas that are normally underwater and, and some interesting things are found. There's nothing really rare. Or, you know, that, I, that we found, right? right? It could be there, you don't know. But it is, this year does present an opportunity to actually go look and driving by on 13, I've definitely been like, I gotta get out there, but I had so many goals that, I just, that was one I didn't get to. Okay. Thank you.